Those often excluded chapters I spoke of before are The Piper at the Gates of Dawn and Wayfarers All. Only one other adaptation, that introduced by Vanessa Redgrave in the mid-90s, incorporates both sequences. The stop-motion version from the early 80s did not, but a later spin-off series would find a way to include both. For the days pass and never return, and the South still waits for you. Others, Disney's The Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad, first out of the gate, the Australian version from the late 80s, the three-part TV movie from the mid-90s, the live-action interpretation, first with the Monty Python crew and then from Masterpiece Theatre, all privileged the drama of Toad and Toad Hall to varying degrees. Didn't he see me in single combat? In this, they follow A.A. A. Milne, the novel's first adapter. For the sake of a stage drama, he left out what he himself called the book's best parts. There's some ongoing irony in this, since when Disney World replaced its Mr. Toad ride, already very much emphasizing the comic action of the story, it replaced the attraction with one of A.A. A. Milne's most famous characters. My own journey with this movie begins around 1988, when my father taped the film off TV. For years, this VHS tape was the only way I watched The Wind in the Willows. I merely passed them on to you the way they reached me. The commercial break made a rather sharp cut right from the contemplative Edwardian milieu of Willows and developed into quite a nostalgia piece in itself. Just one sip of Capri Sun starts the fun. It was as an adult, or at least a teenager, that I finally understood who the voices behind these creatures actually were, many of them popping up in films I came across in my own explorations. As a child moviegoer, adolescent cinephile, or admittedly in some cases, only when researching this video. What a surprise! But the actors were also staples of TV. They appeared in commercials. Can't beat it. Lipton's quality blend with its orange pico tea. No, they are just like that. I hate you. British anthology series. Groovy. Children's entertainment. Now, Luis, I want to ask you a very, very important question. Have you heard about Charles Nelson Reilly? And yeah. game shows. He got a blank while streaking. <laughs> what did well, you I say, know he Jim? got arrested, but they had to release ah. him for insufficient evidence. <laughs> <laughs> At least one of them was parodied on Saturday Night Live. Well, hello, James Lipton. <laughs> I'm King Lord. There's a troll in Central Park. And of course, one of these performers fathered the actor behind a character from another favorite story of mine. And you, chowderhead yokel, you blithering hayseed, you, you, you've had enough of me? Dinner Friday? No, I have previous plans. On Friday, I'm dining alone. I hate company. Years after first experiencing the movie. The wide world. Now, I've never been there, and I'm never going. I incorporated clips into an experimental found. film cities here today, someplace else tomorrow, oh, the world before you, and a horizon always changing. The subject rhymed with the story's themes. And I finally designed a lengthy online series on the book, illustrated by images of the various adaptations, and structured around seven concepts at the heart of Wind in the Willows, relating the narrative elements to the broader context. The riverbank is the key to everything, with its combination of restless energy and solid roots. The downside is that it gives one ambitions beyond itself. At its root lies the siren call of the piper, which is too heart-stirring to be experienced and remembered in full. Nonetheless, that music of the dawn provides the tempo for all the more mundane magic of the river. The wildwood is the forbidden zone, metaphysically necessary in the abstract, but go too close, and the existential angst shatters the ego rather than builds up character. The wide world's dreamy call facilitates the soul's dramatic stirrings, but should not be explored, lest the dream wither. The open road, and with it human society and modern civilization, is an unavoidable reality, but should be held at a distance, kept from encroaching on the low-key magic of the natural world as much as possible. Toad Hall is the crucial buffer, a locus of privilege negotiating between the riverbank and both the wild wood and the open road. Toad Hall's existence secures that of the animal kingdom as not a place, but a concept, a way for human necessities and animal instincts to keep one another in check. Finally, home, Dulce Domum, provides that essential anchor, not a security wall like Toad Hall, but a foundation upon which everything else can be built. Home. 
a source of renewal safely buried away. If Graham's vision of the world is deeply conservative, socially and temperamentally, it is also deeply aware of, and longs for, what lies beyond the comforts it offers. If fear of the larger world lends the story a poignancy, the sensitivity to what remains behind gives both the book and the various adaptations, including this one, a replenishing power. Who's disturbing me at this hour? Doesn't anybody understand? I hate company. The thought of someone sitting next to me is a bore. I hate company. Even making conversation is a chore. I hate company. Be it 240 or 50 at a ball. I hate company. I hate company. Simply can't abide society at all. The thought of all the silly chatter necessary When you climb the social ladder gives me worry Get-togethers give me pause I'm an introvert because I hate company I simply hate company He hates company The how are you's and what you do's give me a pain He hates company from all the shaking hands and smiling, I'll abstain. He hates company. Whether I'm the host or the invited guest. He hates company. I hate company. Don't invite me, I'm a certifiable pest. <laughs>